Hello everyone, I'm Tish Callamer, Community Engagement Manager here at the Gail Borden Public Library. I'd like to welcome you to Veterans Voices 2021, our panel discussion. Veterans Voices brings to life the experiences of our local veterans and honors their contributions. This video will offer what we hope to be a flexible and convenient way for teachers and educators to bring these experiences to their classrooms during this age of Zoom. What better way to celebrate Veterans Day than to hear from the veterans themselves? They have many compelling stories and we welcome you to join in as we listen. Hello, my name is Bill Baker. Uh, I, was, uh, I served four and a half years in the Navy. Uh, I got there through a draft uh, as I was trying to uh, earn more money to continue my college education. But I got two years of college in before I had to uh, report for duty in San Diego at the uh, Recruit Tr Training Center. Um, I served three tours of duty in Vietnam. Um, I, my highest rank was E5. Uh, my service uh, was between 1962 and 1966. I'd, <clears throat> I'd got drafted when I was 22 years of age because I had spent some time in college before, I, before Uncle Sam caught up with me. My name is Lee Elizabeth Ellington. I w went into the United States Navy. I was rated, when I got out, I was a HM1, which is hospital man first class. I was in basically uh, my first part of my service time was stateside. Matter of fact, all mine was stateside. Um, I was up at Great Lakes and did three years up there on active duty. Then I got out, had babies, and went back in reserve-wise. I got pulled up for Desert Storm and was in Charleston, South Carolina for nine months. And then I also got pulled up later for uh, Freedom Eagle and was in uh, Norfolk, Virginia for three months. I served in the military for 21 years, so I am retired and have the benefits of the retirement. I did enlist, but being my name is Lee, they automatically sent me draft notice also, but by that time I was already enlisted. And I started in the Navy when I was 19, right out of high school. Hello, my name is Gilbert Acosta. I am a U.S. Navy retiree. I uh, retired finally at the rank of captain, and um, this was after serving uh, from 1963 to 1967 on active duty during the Vietnam era. I served aboard ships uh, that were uh, working along the coastline and within Vietnam at the time. Uh, I uh, got out of the uh, off active duty in 1967, again, after I'm at 71 after uh, four years of active duty. And I stayed in the reserves until I was retired by the Navy at 19, uh, 1991 after 28 years of total service. I too, like I say, enjoy the benefits of a retired uh, military person. Uh, I was, uh, I enlisted uh, just ahead of the draft during the Vietnam period so that uh, I had a choice of either going into the enlisted ranks or volunteering to go through OCS, which I selected, which automatically gave me more time to serve on active duty uh, than one who was uh, drafted into the service. I certainly enjoyed my uh, 28 years of service with the Navy. My name is Rob Bredo. Uh, at the age of 21, I was drafted into the Army in 1967. I spent two years in the Army. Uh, before I was drafted into the Army, I was married 10 months and then drafted. Um, I was trying to be in the Navy Air at Glenview Naval Air Station and uh, had the opportunity, but they did not have an opening until the day after I left, uh, was drafted and was drafted into the Army. Uh, they called my wife and said, send them down, but it was a little too late. Um, I ended up uh, as a combat infantryman uh, in Vietnam. 
uh, and we range between the Laotian border and the Cambodian border. Uh, after my enlistment, um, I got out of the uh, Army. I went back to school on the GI Bill and got my degree as an engineer. Um, my name is Dennis McClure. Uh, my branch of service was the first time uh, was the U.S. Army. Uh, second time was U.S. Air Force. Uh, I achieved the rank in the Army of uh, E-4, which is not too high on the scale. I, uh, in the Air Force, I achieved the rank of Major when I finished. Um, as far as wars, campaigns, service areas, etc., cetera, um, in the Army, I served in Germany most of my time there. Um, uh, that was for three years. My Air Force time was um, uh, in the beginning, Vietnam from 1969 to 1970. I was flying F-4s in, in uh, Vietnam. Most of my missions were on uh, Laos and uh, some in North Vietnam. I served in the Army from 1959 until 1962. And uh, the Air Force I served uh, from 1967 until 1984 when I retired from the Air Force. Um, uh, as I said before, my Army time was enlisted. My Air Force time was uh, as an officer. I, uh, I'm from a small town in Minnesota called Maple Lake. Uh, I had uh, a wonderful experience there because we were a small school there was 45 people in my senior class, of which only 38 were left at by the time we got to the end of that year, because most of them had gone back to the farm. Most of the, uh, my classmates, particularly the men, inherited the farms from their grandfathers or fathers. Maple Lake is 45 miles northwest of the Twin Cities. And uh, it took me until my 22nd birthday to find out what it was like to fly in an airplane which took me to San Diego for my basic training. And, uh, and then after that, I was, seemed like I spent an awful lot of time in airplanes because I was based in the Far East and most of my flights from that point forward were from either from San Francisco or from Minneapolis. And uh, those, both those locations are quite a ways from, uh, uh, from Vietnam. I grew up on a farm of about a hundred acres down near Peoria, Illinois. And um, being a small farm, I was out in the country. I also went to school in Galva, which is not far away. And that was also a small school. When I graduated from the Galva High School, there was only 64 that graduated at the time. The school had a whole 500 in it. So, um, as you can see, I grew up on a very small area, was pretty much watched over and taken care of by my family and my parents. So I didn't know what was going on in the outer world that much. I grew up uh, in the uh, central part of California. I was born and raised there pretty much. And uh, a lot of farming uh, was done in the, in the area uh, where I grew up. So I had the opportunity to work a lot of uh, farms uh, picking this, picking that, and, you know, earning money as I could. Uh, fortunately, at that time, uh, California schools were, uh, colleges were fairly inexpensive, so after graduating uh, out of high school, I, I did okay. I wasn't the most super student, but I, I did okay, and I was able to get into the, uh, one of the universities in California, and at the time, it cost me a total of, uh, of about $79 a year in tuition to go through the University of California. That's when uh, uh, the state had a lot of money. And uh, currently that uh, same school costs you $17,000. So, you know, it's changed a lot. But again, it gave me the opportunity to go th through and get myself a degree. It took me five years, but I got my degree. And at the age of 22, I was uh, ready to march on. And uh, uh, there was the Navy waiting for me. Before I got married to my high school sweetheart, <clears throat> I graduated 
with an associate degree in electrical engineering. And uh, that's what prompted me to try to get into the Navy Air, uh, but that didn't work out. Um, was married and uh, after 10 months was uh, drafted into the Army. And uh, on honeymoon year, it uh, was kind of devastating for the two of us. Um, but uh, I packed my bags and uh, went off to the Army and um, that was a little difficult. Uh, we were put together with uh, many different people from the city of Chicago and the suburbs. And uh, that's where I started to learn about many things that uh, I will tell you about a little later. I grew up in a small town, uh, central Illinois. Uh, small town was Danvers, Illinois. It's about 13 miles to the uh, west of, um, of uh, Bloomington, Illinois. Um, small graduating class of 23. We all knew each other. That can be good and that can be bad, but we were like a big club. But I actually, um, I guess I couldn't wait to, to get away from that small town, so right after graduation, I enlisted in the Army. I did three years in the Army, took a break, went to college, graduated, and then entered the Air Force. Okay, I was, at this point in time in life, I'm at uh, 22, 23 years of age. And I had, basic batteries are, were something I had never been exposed to before, psychological evaluations and all kinds of work interests and so forth. And so I, when I, the first thing I encountered when I uh, began my actual military experience is that the people that I reported to had all this information about me that I'd never had before myself. Basic battery, who am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> Do I want to stay here? Uh, it was just a very, very uh, eye-opening experience for me to, to see that. And then I been getting, and then with the other experience, the, the uh, uh, athletic experience and so forth, I was, I, I was surprised to find out how visible I became to people that were making decisions about my life going forward because they had information about me as a human being that I didn't even have before I entered the service. Uh, I knew what my uh, weak points were and what my strong points were and, uh, and how they could be managed within a military environment to get the most out of Bill Baker while he was there. Uh, so the first thing I got was I was, re I was uh, identified and made the, the recruiting, uh, recruiting chief petty officer for my company. In the, uh, in the in the in uh, the basic training environment, I had forty some young men from all over the country, uh, and I literally all over the country from West Virginia to to uh, to Yuma, Arizona, people that had different views of the world, different experiences, and so forth, and it was quite an experience for me to t take those kinds of diverse experiences and point them in a direction that was common to all the people that I was, that were reporting to me in that, in that company. Uh, and I began to realize that there's more to Bill Baker than Bill Baker even knew about himself at that particular point in time. All of a sudden I could see things where I could plug in, where I would never even be given the opportunity to even look at them as, a, as an alternative. So uh, as a result of that, I. Uh, I headed up every United Way campaign, I think, in my career of, of 25 years, uh, and because they felt that that was something that I would relate to effectively. Uh, but I guess the most, and then the most memorable, I was went into uh, un underwater demolition training uh, 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 Unit 12, and I was. Uh, for a guy that was colorblind, I did some. I was assigned some strange things that when other people found out what I was doing with colorblindness, like I cranked out 15 tons of explosives that we had taken out of a, a destroyer from World War II, and the, and they weren't supposed to go off because they'd been sitting in all that muck and so and, and dampness in that ship for all those years. I don't think there was a, an ounce of it that didn't go off. We blew half the tape. The the uh, half the uh, 
China off the shelves in the mess hall, mess hall as a result of that. It was quite a, and I was before the, the uh, head of the commander of the uh, of UDT or underwater basic training school in San Diego, explaining to them how would I ever go, why did I ever get involved in something that was that uh, significant? Well, because I didn't, again, I wasn't trained uh, very effectively and uh, I loved to hear big bangs and, <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> but uh, I, I came out of the service, I was a different person than when I went in. I, I, I can't even hardly identify the, the, the commonalities between the two. I mean, I, there were a, certainly a, a, lot, a lot of, of things that were common, but the ones that stand out most in my mind are the ones that were uncommon where I was in charge of other people's lives in their training, uh, where I was, uh, I was just, I was doing a lot of leadership stuff that I hadn't done before. And I found out that leadership was something I really enjoyed. And I was pretty good at it. And, uh, and as a result, I got a lot of recognition from the uh, command of the, of the uh, basic training in San Diego for, uh, for having taken these young men from all over the country and turning them into people that were thinking about What's life going to provide me going forward now that I have all this experience? And that's it. <laughs> I think the most memorable period of my life in the service was going through basic training about the same time that they put me on a little a bus and we drove into the basic training camp. I looked around and went, oh my God, what have I got myself into? but it was already too late and so I had to stay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the other thing is just learning military life. I always heard dad say things like the times and things like that to us kids. So I, I knew some of that and understood some of that, but it, it really gets drilled into you more as you go through the military. I learned um, how to take orders and you can't talk back to anybody. And I also learned there is an awful lot of different nationalities, different types of people, which I never got before. I also f learned that people thought women that went into the Navy went into the Navy because they were running away from home, they were lesbians or they were prostitutes, so they were only interested in one thing, and that was not true with any of that with me. So that was kind of a shocker also when I started. Different people, we didn't have any na different nationalities where I grew up. So then I got to meet people from other countries and from other parts of the United States, and the difference in the way we all talk, which really surprised me. Like many that uh, joined the military, uh, one of the first things they experience is uh, equivalent of boot camp. And uh, the officer uh, training school, the officer candidate school that I went to uh, in 1963, uh, shortly after graduating from uh, college, was quite a shocker. Uh, in, uh, first thing was, is not having ever flown anywhere or gone any place of any distance, I was flown from California to Newport, Rhode Island and uh, that's where the 16-week uh, uh, OCS uh, school is, is located. And it was, uh, it was quite a challenge because uh, at the time I joined, I knew nothing about the Navy, I knew nothing about ships. Uh, the only thing I knew about a ship was there was a blunt end and a pointy end, and uh, through OCS they taught me what to call the front and the back of a ship. And uh, it was, uh, again, something that was uh, uh, very, uh, revealing in terms of your own character, your ability to blend in and mesh with these uh, in, in a company of uh, 60 candidates that were trying to get through the school. And here we were struggling uh, and trying to help one another to make sure you got through. So you absolutely knew the meaning of teamwork because if you didn't work as a team, you weren't gonna survive OCS or any other type of a boot camp. Uh, the other thing that I did um, it was a little different, and this was during uh, shipboard life. I was uh, one of the first persons that was uh, selected to fly drone helicopters. And drone helicopters in 1963, 1964 were kind of unheard of, and uh, 
they're a big deal now. Drones are big now. At that time, uh, drones were not a big a deal, but they were an effective uh, weapon system that uh, I was part of helping de develop uh, uh, use for in, in the Navy. After <clears throat> getting into boot camp and understanding the different things that they wanted you to do, it was uh, quite rigorous. And, um, but at the end of boot camp, um, we're all given orders. My orders were as a dental technician. Now, I had a two-year degree in electrical engineering, which I guess they surmised would be about the same. But <clears throat> um, I felt, well, that's okay. I, I, whether I go to Vietnam or I stay stateside or wherever I go, dental technician is not a, a, a bad position. But uh, eight hours later, they rescinded all orders to everyone going in many different places because uh, the president said, I want everyone to go to Vietnam uh, as combat. So if you wanted to re-enlist for another four years, um, then you know you could pick a school you wanted to go to. So I said, no, I'll, I'll stick with going to uh, advanced infantry training and then going to Vietnam. Um, I ended up in the 1st Cavalry, which is Custard's Cav, if any of you know who General Custer was. Uh, it's the Horse Cavalry, though we rode helicopters and not horses, um, which was the first air division to have helicopters. I was uh, part of the uh, camp combat infantry group. Uh, it was also a C4 plastics explosives expert and on a machine gun squad. Um, we carried 40 pounds of plastic explosives to um, detonate uh, bombs that hadn't gone off and uh, bunkers and other underground things that uh, the enemy had. Um, it was on a machine gun squad, a 50 cal machine gun squad, which we carried in the Laotian Mountains. Uh, and they told us we didn't have to carry it when we came down to along the Cambodian border. Um, the interesting thing uh, and, and the most memory is of working together as a team, working together as a group. Um, I became a squad, a squad leader and then a sergeant before I left. Okay, talking about most memorable, memorable experiences, um, like Lee referred to, um, when, I, when I left home, at the age of 18 and got into basic training, it was just a totally different different world. All of a sudden, somebody's telling me when to get up, uh, when to brush my teeth, when to shine my shoes, when to make my bed. And I really felt like I had volunteered to go to prison. But I soon found out that um, uh, you learn to be a team player at least if you're going to survive and, and make it work. You learn to be a team player. And that terribly, terrible homesickness that I felt at first soon went away. Pretty soon you're making new friends. You're going different places. And you get used to it and, and you fit in. Um, another memorable experience, I would say, uh, having grown up in a very small town um, and um, not having traveled hardly at all. Remember, I grew up on a farm. We had on a dairy farm. We had to do that thing 24-7. So I didn't, didn't travel like a lot of kids did. And one of the most memorable things, I can remember leaving the U.S. This was when I was in the Army. Leaving the U.S. and arriving in, in Germany, experiencing a whole new uh, culture, you might say, a new land. Uh, but very, very memorable. And probably the, the most um, enduring experience that I, I got from the military was the many friendships that I, I made uh, through the years that I still have today. The military was a very definite uh, division of my life before the military and my life after the military. I had a whole different attitude about 
who I was and what I was put here to, to do than before I, uh, I went into uh, the military. I, 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 all the leadership things that were giving, giving me the opportunity to practice leadership for, with other members of the military seemed to all of a sudden click for me. I could just, I had, I had kind of hindsight vision in terms of, or foresight vision in terms of the things that I needed to focus on if I was going to be a leader of, of military people. And I was an E5 at that particular point in time, which, you know, I was, there were E6s and E7s that were ahead of me in that, uh, in that ranking system. But I, I really focused in on those things that were going to be most important to myself and to them in their life beyond the military. So we talk, started talking about attitude and uh, uh, con commitment and uh, uh, once you sign on for do, to do something, you sign on to do it, not to just think about doing it. And I really pondered that into a lot of people during the, during this, uh, the, the last uh, couple of years that I, uh, that I was in the, in, the, in the military. One of the things I was asked to do was to join the uh, Department of uh, uh, Human Resource Development for the state of Mississippi because some of the things that we did kind of stood out to some of the key people down there. And uh, so I had a chance to work with individuals that were, do, that were involved in workforce development for the state of Mississippi under all the, the Clinton era uh, incentives and so forth. Uh, this is where I really kind of got off the, the, the bus that I was on and got onto a, a new one that took me places that I hadn't been before. So my learning curve was, was kind of growing gradually and all of a sudden it, was, it just took off. I, uh, it's, it's amazing once you get enough information uh, and enough experience which you, that you can see things that you've never seen before, see opportunities that you've never seen before. And I really tried to take advantage of those uh, in my last uh, year, year and a half uh, in, in the military. Uh, There's just so much more. I mean, when I sat back to think about what I was going to say to, in, in these things, I, there was no way that I could digest it into just a small pieces because it changed my life. I'm, I'm not the Bill Baker that went into the military in 1962. I'm the Bill Baker that graduated from college in 1966 with the degrees in the in management and in marketing and all the things that followed that. So that's, that's the beginning of a very rich life that continues to be a very rich life. Thank you. I um, ended up with the break in service and going to school. And going to school, I got my RN in the long run. I was an LPN first and then went back and got my RN and the government paid for all of my schooling. I always wanted to be a nurse and I got to be a nurse. But being that I'd been in the military also, they always gave me the patients that had trouble with PTSD thinking I could handle it. <laughs> I had no clue. But anyway, um, the other thing I noticed was the fact that when I got patients in from other countries or something, I would talk to them and talk to their family members and sometimes if the doctors would put them on routine diets or whatever, I would tell the family to go ahead and bring food in for the patient to eat because they don't like our food. Uh, they eat different types of food and different ways of making it. So it helps. Um, I had one patient that would only eat the hospital, uh, would only get hospital food and the patient wasn't eating at all. The doctor refused to send the patient home because he wasn't eating. I asked the family if they could please bring in some food from home, and they did. The patient inhaled it. He was discharged immediately. So it, it's good to know those pieces of information about the difference in the nationalities and the food. Um, also, I had another nurse that was from the Philippines, um, her husband and her baby finally came to be with her. She was talking to me one day and I said to her, do you have a crib for the baby? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, and then I thought, I said, wait a minute, your people sleep on the floor, don't they? And she said, yeah. And I says, 
well, go ahead and sleep on the floor. It doesn't make any difference. It isn't like any police is going to break in and tell you that you broke the law because you were sleeping on the floor and not in the bed. And she looked at me and she had the biggest grin on her face and she was very thankful that I said that to her because people don't realize that being in different countries and different methods and techniques and food and clothing and dress and religion's the other thing. You got to find out kind of their way. It doesn't mean you're gonna change to their religion. It just means you find out their methods and their techniques and what they feel and what they think and what is going on with them at that time. And it does help you with their care. I received my uh, degree in industrial engineering when I got out of school. And um, one of the things I learned uh, is a division officer aboard a ship where I had 30 persons, uh, sailors reporting to me, uh, how do you get them to do what you want them to do uh, short of ordering them to do it? Because what I, can, I had the authority to order them to do it, but how do you influence them to do it like it's their own idea and uh, come together and work as a group in completing some of the missions that we were given to do aboard ship? Uh, so, as an industrial engineer, you had the same issue trying to get people to re respond to changes that you want to make in a production line or in a manufacturing facility. How do you influence them or talk to them and get them together to make them or show them that it's in their best interest to perform and complete a mission, which is, a again, uh, a manufacturing task. Uh, now, how did... Uh, one of, one of the things that, um, that you learn is that <clears throat> teamwork, it, again, we, we've talked about it as being an essential part of getting things done. And whether or not it's military or civilian side of life, uh, working as a team has always been a, a goal of mine to make sure that uh, we get the mission or the task accomplished uh, as efficiently as possible. I think the, the thing that I've learned the most uh, is my determination to write out the hard times, to put one foot in front of the other and never give up and always having a positive attitude no matter what you're doing. I think those are some of the things that, that I learned in the military that I've taken on to uh, the rest of my life, uh, especially after um, getting out of the the army. Um, I went from the jungle into a classroom to finish my degree, my engineering degree. And it was such a powerful change that I was floundering. I mean, it, it was too much for my emotions to handle. And I asked two professors if they would help me, mentor me through the these grades that weren't looking very well. And they totally understood, one of them being a World War II veteran. And not only did they mentor me, but they watched out for me, make sure that I was guided and directed. And that has led me to mentoring high school students and college students um, through their time through school because Everyone needs a mentor. And so that's, that has really formed who I am. Uh, the other thing is really working together as a team. Um, team building, mentoring, it all works together because as a team, you're mentoring each other. Um, this was what really helped me get through the hard times. Um, and what I can what I can tell you and, and other and students and even older folks, never give up, never give up because things will always get better. I think a, a lot of the things that I learn are common to the rest of the panel members here. Uh, you, you learn to associate with a lot of different people, a lot of different backgrounds. You learn to give them slack to uh, consider their, their opinions and their way of doing things. And you learn that the way you do things is not the only way. Um, the other thing, um, 
that I used a great deal, especially when I got out of the Army after my enlisted time, was the GI Bill. Uh, while I was in college, I got married. I had a child, and the GI Bill helped me uh, a great deal. And um, that, of course, that was before I entered the Air Force. So the GI Bill was a big thing. I got out of it. Um, that's still something that, that young people can enjoy if they're in the military um, today. Uh, the other thing I got out of the service, especially when I finished my years in the Air Force, um, I got a really good job with Northrop Grumman Corporation. Uh, for example, uh, my degree was in education when I graduated from college, but because of my uh, aircraft experience, my Air Force experience, I got a job with Northrop Grumman as a system test engineer, which was a very good job at the time. So uh, lots, of, lots of benefits, uh, and I'm personally grateful for all of those. One of the first things I would tell somebody that is, was in the kind of training that I was involved in is get a piece of paper and, paper, uh, and pencil and write down the things that, that you did best in this new assignment that you've been given. And uh, how will you take that forward into your, your life beyond this training and, uh, and use it uh, productively? One of the things that I became very involved in after I got out of the service was marriage encounter. I, uh, I stuck with that for a better part of, th uh, th I guess, 15 or 20 years. And, and uh, it, was, it was so, it was a, so powerful in my life in terms of having got affiliated with that particular training that I knew that others that would take, give it a chance in their lives, they would ha may have the same experiences that I had. Uh, and I believe one of the things that I, that emanated from this was that I always sit, followed through on what I promised. If I accepted assignment or if I, affected, if I told somebody I was going to do something for them, I did it for them. And I always did that from that point forward. I didn't leave anybody hanging with a question that they needed answered. And so that would, uh, that, and, and, and then I, get, I was in human resources. I had a career in human resources that was almost 40 years long. So I got a chance to uh, test it a lot. Take care of yourself. Life lessons. Well, life is very hard. You think it's hard when you're growing up, but once you leave home, those apron strings are hard to cut. But the military does seem to have that capability with you. You keep on working on your dreams. When I was little, I kept thinking about the fact I wanted to be a cowgirl. I wanted to go in the military. And I really wanted to be a nurse. Well, I went into the military, and while I was in, I found out there was a rodeo outfit running with our mid, uh, military group. So I joined that, so I got to be a cowgirl, and for a short period I was classified as the rodeo queen for the Great Lakes, wow. even though I didn't know that much about riding. <laughs> um, after I got out, I went into nursing school. I couldn't get into it beforehand because I had a lot of uh, dyslexia problems and I learned how to work around those. So I got to be an LPN and then later on got to be an RN and of course the government paid for all that. When you run into little roadblocks that happen to keep you from doing what you really want to do, talk to people. See if there's a way around it or something else along that line that you can do that you really would be in that area. There's a lot of things out there and you need to ask and request and keep going. Don't ever stop and just think, oh, I can't do that. You don't know. You got to work on it and keep working for it. The other thing the military seems to help with is camaraderie. I was just talking to Dennis a little bit ago. Camaraderie is something that we get. All of us that have been in the military, it's a closeness with each other. We learn that we have to be close to that person and be our people 
get to know them, they get to know you because you have to rely on them to protect you, to be there for you when you need them. You don't get that in civilian life. And I am aware of many people that after they got out of the military, they, they just went berserk, couldn't figure things out, be able to function like they should have been able to function and found out they went back into the military just so they could get that camaraderie that they need to help stabilize them. So you need to continue on with your life, keep working at whatever you really want to do and see if there's any way that you can get it. I know many of the young people who are getting ready to get out of school don't really know what they want to do with their life. It's, you, you get out and you're wondering, what do I want to do? Do I want to go to college, get a trade or whatever? But I'm here to tell you that uh, you don't have to go to college to be a success. Right now there's great demands for other types of uh, technicians and other, other kinds of work that don't need a college degree necessarily. But if you're still floundering and you're not sure what you want to do with your life, take a look at the military because many of the things that you may consider wanting to do are available to you through military training. Doesn't matter what branch of the service, you will get the, a type of training that will advance you in your civilian life once you get out. So it's one of those things where uh, it's your choice. Uh, it, sometimes it takes a while for you to find out what you want to do. I know in my own personal life, I've had a number of friends and relatives who were at the age of 20, 21, 22, still trying to find themselves. And with a little bit of coaching, uh, they've joined the military and they have wound up very successful in their careers and getting out of the active duty and becoming very successful business people because they've taken their trades that they learned in the military and converted into an asset which is a good paying civilian job. Hard times will always come. Be determined and follow through on the things you want to strive for. Earlier I mentioned mentoring. Um, if I didn't have those two mentors when I got out of the service and went back to school, I don't think I'd be where I am today. And that's why I've put a lot of my time into mentoring. Uh, find a good mentor. Most important, um, let that mentor challenge you, not tell you what to do, but to challenge you. There's another thing that the military taught me about brotherhood and sisterhood. Of all, of all people, all races, all creeds, everyone matters. And remember, we all bleed the same blood, the same color. It's all, we're all the same. We're all the same people. Learn to work together as a team. Learn to work together no matter who are the other people around you. This is one reason that I became the chaplain for our veterans group. And I would just ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? Okay. This is a hard one, especially for, for young people, because you hear it so much. But I would say, advice, I would say stay in school and try to be the best student you can. It's sometimes tough, but it'll serve you well. Uh, secondly, I would say stay out of trouble. All of us, young and old, pretty much know what's right or wrong. And especially if you think you might want uh, to, to be in the military at some time, stay out of trouble with the law. If you get in deep trouble, as in a, a felony, that can prohibit you from, from getting in the military in the first place. And um, thirdly, I, I would say learn to uh, consider both sides of an argument. Uh, it helps to, to uh, when you've got a really strong opinion and somebody voices uh, an opposing opinion, give it some thought and try to put yourself in their shoes. And um, 
otherwise follow your dreams.